So welcome everyone uh, to the UVM Extension New Farmer Project webinar, The Ins and Outs of Insurance for Farm Businesses. Uh, my name is Jesse Schmidt, and I help coordinate the New Farmer uh, program here um, at UVM Extension. Just a few housekeeping things uh, to get started. If you've just joined us, I do recommend uh, that you take a second to go through the Audio Setup Wizard under Tools um, on the top left hand of the screen. It will improve your audio quality. Um, if you haven't already and might be interested in follow-up information, uh, put your email address into the chat box um, and we will send information out to you after the webinar. And also, uh, the chat box is going to be the way that we're communicating here today. Um, so any questions or comments as we go along, go ahead and type them into that uh, little box there on the left-hand corner. Um, Kevin will try and pick them up as he goes along, and I'll keep track of them as well. So we'll try to get to everyone's uh, questions here. So uh, ins and outs of insurance or farm businesses, Kevin Burdon is our presenter here today from Cooperative Insurance Companies. Um, Kevin has uh, grew up on a dairy farm in Middlebury and now operates a farm in Walsham, Vermont. And he has been insuring farm businesses since 1984. He's got a lot of information to share with us. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and let him uh, get started. Well, thank you, Jessica, and uh, welcome everyone to this evening's uh, presentation. I'm uh, speaking to you uh, live from not so sunny Middlebury, Vermont. Um, it's a little uh, overcast and uh, a little cool. So, uh, but we've had a, nonetheless we've had a wonderful summer here, and uh, it's been a great summer for farming. Uh, just a little background, as Jessica said. Uh, uh, born on a farm, uh, I, I now raise uh, dairy replacement heifers uh, in a little town just about 10 miles north of Middlebury here, and um, have been working with this company, uh, Co-op Insurance Company, uh, for 26 years, and uh, have uh, been around uh, the farm business a, a very long time, and the insurance, particularly the farm insurance business, a very long time. So with that, um, we can get started. I um, our first slide uh, just goes over the um, topics that we'll be addressing tonight. Uh, for example, um, what is insurance and why have it? Um, the types of insurance to consider and how these policies will respond to you and the public. Uh, and then insurance for your farm and, and associated costs. So with that, we'll uh, start with the, uh, with the next slide. There we go. So. What is insurance? Now, probably many of you have insurance, I would guess. Uh, most everyone does. It is, uh, it is a, a contract where one party, uh, that would be you, and the insurance company uh, undertake to ident uh, indemnify or guarantee another, you or your farm, against loss by specific contingency or peril. So, so basically what you're doing is you're, you're asking someone to uh, transfer the risk from you to them to pay a third party in the event that uh, either liability happens, uh, claims happen, or uh, in the event that uh, your property is lost and you, you know, uh, most people don't have the wherewithal to uh, pay those costs to rebuild a building, um, and uh, that's that's essentially uh, what it's for. Um, and if we look at the, the bottom paragraph, uh, the purpose of having insurance, uh, not only to protect yourself, your livelihood and assets, but it's in the best interest of society. Um, for those in, of us who work and play uh, in the public arena to take responsibility for our own actions that may cause damage to persons or property. So basically, uh, an insurance contract also guarantees the general public that, that you're around, that you're exposed to, and uh, uh, you know that they're protected in, in some fashion. Uh, in the event that uh, you know your car goes off the road or your animals get out or uh, the products you're producing uh, make them sick, uh, you know it, it, it prevents, uh, eliminates the necessity for the rest of us to have to come in and pay that via the government or or some type of uh, uh, bailout type situation. So uh, that's kind of the the public interest area of of insurance. Um, Let's see. Okay, we'll go to the next one here. Okay, so types of uh, insurance. Uh, I'll start with the uh, 
probably the most uh, commonly uh, purchased insurance. Uh, you see it every day. You see it probably too many times a day advertised uh, in front of you on TV or on the radio. Uh, this is the auto insurance policy. Um, this policy, it, uh, it provides you uh, protection against losses uh, in, in incurred as a result of an accident uh, and uh, in the event that uh, uh, something uh, happens to that vehicle, whether a tree falls on it or a hail fall on it or uh, a lightning hits it and it burns up, that type of thing. Uh, so typically, typical uh, policies uh, include bodily injury. So that's uh, in the event that uh, you're in an accident and uh, someone is injured or killed, that type of thing, or property damage. That would be the damage that you would do to someone else's vehicle or someone else's property. Uh, run off the road and you uh, damage their fence or their, their dwelling uh, or their building or, or some sort. Uh, in addition to that, uh, you have medical payments. So essentially what the medical payments do for you is cover you. That's, that's basically what we call a no-fault uh, coverage that you would have. So that not only covers the passengers in your car for, let's say, a $5,000 limit uh, in the event that there's an accident and they have to go to the uh, emergency room, that type of thing, but it also includes the operator and the owner of the vehicle as well. That's probably the only time you're going to see that coverage uh, in any of the uh, policies that I discussed tonight. And then uh, you have a comprehensive and collision. Comprehensive is, again, we're talking about the, uh, the vehicle uh, being destroyed by a tree falling on it or someone stealing that. It's basically every other peril other than collision, other than you going off the road and, and uh, uh, colliding with something. Um, so and so the cost of this uh, coverage uh, obviously depends on the uh, uh, the vehicle type, the value of the vehicle, uh, the driver's age, the driving record of the operator, uh, the territory that it's uh, is being uh, garaged in, uh, whether it be a rural location. Uh, or an urban location. Uh, in an urban location, typically the premiums are much higher due to the uh, the um, risk of, of it being stolen or, or that type of thing or damaged by so many other vehicles uh, exposed to it. Uh, use of the vehicle, uh, you know, for example, uh, you know, if you're just using it to for pleasure use or if you're using it to uh, drive back and forth to work, uh, the mileage uh, to and from tends to uh, change the premium, increases the, the premium the, uh, the more you drive. Uh, and deductibles that you would have the, the coverage that uh, the, the amount that you would assume in the event of a loss uh, that you would have to pay out of pocket. Uh, so just in, with auto insurance, I would uh, estimate that a lot of the uh, smaller farming operations typically will have only a, a personal auto policy, uh, usually a car. Some of some will have pickups uh, and use those uh, pretty exclusively on the farm. Um, something I would recommend um, that uh, you do when you, if you have a policy, I'm sure you do, is to make sure that uh, if you're using it exclusively on the farm, uh, to make sure it is classified as farm use. That will give you a uh, a pretty good discount on your premium uh, due to the fact that. Uh, the farm use of the vehicle uh, anticipates that um, you know you're only going to be driving it very seldom and uh, perhaps going to the into town uh, very rarely that type of thing. So so that's something uh, you should be aware of. Uh, in addition to that, um, I just made a note here. The uh, if you have employees, certainly the employees are are eligible to drive that vehicle as well with uh, with your permission. So that kind of that takes care of the, the personal auto uh, policy. Um, then we can go on. So the next, the next policy I'm going to talk about here, next coverage, is farm owner's insurance. So farm owner's insurance is really a, um, it's a combination of a personal po insurance policy and a commercial policy. Uh, it includes many of the coverages that uh, you would find on a regular uh, homeowner's policy, and it includes a lot of the coverages that you would find under a commercial policy. Uh, therefore, combining the two, uh, assuming that your farming business is somewhat commercial uh, versus uh, just somebody, you know, 
having a uh, 10 acres and not doing anything with it, uh, you know, they're assuming that you're going to have farm equipment on there and you're going to have, you know, some type of farming exposure. So under the farm policy, your coverage uh, coverages under this include the uh, property coverage on the on the farm dwellings, uh, farm barns, associated structures, so uh, to, uh, tool sheds, uh, you know, storage sheds, chicken houses, uh, uh, you know, those types of things. Um, it also includes uh, in the it's it's what we would refer to as m uh, more of a package policy, which combines uh, many coverages uh, under one policy. So this would also include farm tools and equipment, um, animals. It includes that uh, the farm produce uh, that you're storing there. Um, it, it also ensures uh, the loss of use of the the property. So in the event that uh, there is, a, let's say, you had a, a fire in the barn and it uh, prevented you from uh, earning a living uh, from that. Uh, property for a while, the policy comes in and says, okay, you were earning X amount of dollars per month, we will provide that up to a certain limit under the policy. Uh, income and extra expense coverage, uh, farmers comprehensive liability. So there is, is uh, uh, the liability coverage under this. Uh, it includes both person and farm liability, personal and farm liability. So it acts as uh, liability coverage for uh, you as a you know kind of a private citizen, and it, it, it allows for coverages for your farming uh, exposure as well. Um, so, and I'll get into more of the uh, exposures and the coverages uh, under farm liability uh, in the next couple of slides. So, if we talk about the uh, the premiums for uh, associated with these types of policies, uh, they're determined by many factors. Uh, including the building values, uh, the location of the building, uh, the structures, for example, um, you know, how far were they away from the fire department? Uh, are there any uh, hydrants uh, located within a thousand feet of the buildings or the property? Uh, that makes a pretty dramatic impact on the premium. Uh, obviously, the closer the fire department is and the closer the hydrants are, the quicker they'll be able to put out a fire in the event of uh, uh, something happening like that. Uh, the amounts of uh, <coughs> farm equipment, uh, and that would be um, that would be built-in type equipment in a building. Uh, you know, uh, processing equipment uh, that's that's permanently installed in the buildings. Uh, in a in a small in a dairy, uh, you know, you have your um, you know your stanchions, your your bulk tanks, your compressors, your your uh, uh, pipelines, those types of things. Um, and then, as I say, processing equipment, um, and then uh, values, uh, equipment values, and uh, liability limits as well. So, um, okay. I guess seeing no questions here, right, feel free to certainly uh, shoot any questions this way. Um, okay. So let's talk about the. Commercial auto section. Now we discussed earlier the personal auto coverages. Uh, we'll talk about the commercial coverages, and that's when you're getting getting into a little little larger operation that um, would require this type of vehicle. That's where you're using it pretty exclusively to uh, operate the uh, the farm or the the commercial. Uh, uh, vegetable farm, that type of thing. Um, so this policy, like the personal auto, it provides both liability and uh, physical damage coverage uh, for both on owned and non-owned vehicles. Uh, coverage extends to owners, employees, and anyone working on or servicing the vehicle. Um, typically issued for larger vehicles, uh, 10,000 pounds or more. So that would be your, like there's a truck, a photo of a truck there, uh, your larger box trucks, that type of thing. Uh, and uh, trailers uh, over 2,000 pounds as well. Uh, costs for commercial autos are primarily uh, uh, determined by the usage. Um, there are th basically three categories that we use to classify uh, commercial vehicles. That's a service, retail, or commercial. So the service uh, exposure would be uh, simply you using that uh, to 
provide uh, uh, service around your farm. So you're you're using the vehicle to haul uh, equipment and tools around the farm to service other vehicles or to, to bring supplies uh, in and around the farm, that type of thing. The retail is, uh, uh, as it sounds, uh, you're taking the the vehicle from farm to to ultimate buyer, whether that be um, you know a wholesaler or that something like that. You're bringing, you're actually delivering the product with that vehicle. And commercial is kind of a kind of a general coverall uh, area where we can't fit it into either of the other two. So um, commercial would be more uh, a long haul type situations, uh, those types of things. So, and then uh, uh, the the cost again you know, determined by the use of the vehicle, liability limits, deductibles, and territories. And and again, uh, um, similar to the the personal auto, it depends on where the vehicle is uh, garaged. Um, you know what type of area it is. Uh, every every county uh, virtually is. Um, has a territory associated with it. So depending on which state you're in and what county and what area you're in, that that has a, a direct impact on uh, the types of premiums that you're that you're paying. Okay. Okay, so there's commercial auto. So let's talk about workers comp a little bit. Now I do have a few questions that were uh, submitted uh, prior to this, which I will address in a minute here. Uh, but let's uh, let's talk about the background of workers' comp a little bit, and kind of who needs it, and uh, you know why why we have that. So I'm talking more specifically about Vermont and and other states uh, that are listening in, uh, perhaps have similar uh, 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 history to their workers' comp. So. Uh, basically, workers' comp is a, it's a statutory coverage determined by the state. Uh, the coverage is a no-fault coverage, so uh, there's no blame, essentially. Um, it was established in Vermont, anyway, in 1915, uh, and it was a trade-off. Uh, prior to workers' comp coverage, the only remedy that the employees had uh, was to, to recover uh, from for their injuries uh, was to sue their employer. Uh, so it usually meant the uh, employee uh, ended up losing their jobs, uh, as well as not having the finances to to bring a suit against the employer. So coverage is a trade-off. The uh, the employee agrees. Now this is the, this is a key element here. The employee does agree to accept the benefits provided by the policy in exchange for not suing the employer. Simply by virtue of of having a workers' comp policy, does not uh, eliminate. Uh, uh, or prevent the employee from suing their employer. Uh, the employee is certainly uh, allowed to sue the employer, but they can't uh, collect uh, any medical benefits in that case. Um, so the workers' comp does provide benefits for medical services and supplies uh, related to the job injury uh, and occupational diseases. So it pays all your medical expenses. Uh, and any type of um, you know uh, devices that someone might need uh, if they're disabled, wheelchairs, uh, prosthetics, that type of thing uh, that that people uh, might require as as a result of a uh, uh, an on-the-job injury. Um, in addition to the medical portion, the uh, the workers' comp policy uh, it provides a, a temporary or total temporary partial disability compensation. So essentially, what the uh, what the workers' comp policy does is uh, determine what that individual, uh, what type of uh, salary that individual was making prior to the the injury, uh, and and it depends from state to state what type of formula they use. Uh, it can be. Um, you know the last uh, 12 months uh, of, of salary, that type of thing, and they would average that out and, and use that as a, uh, a baseline to determine a, uh, a proper benefit uh, to be paid to the individual. Okay, so there's that, and then we have a little bit more on uh, workers' comp. So here is the area where um, people. Have been asking questions in terms of, uh, you know, who is required to carry workers' comp, that type of thing. Uh, many of the small farms, uh, many of you, probably don't carry it or, or don't have a need 
to carry it due to the either you don't have employees or how you have so few that your payroll doesn't meet the state minimum. Uh, so here's the uh, here's the rule. Um, unless you're self-insured, which you can be, but that uh, very 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 few people, uh, uh, companies or farmers ever do this. It's it's uh, cost prohibitive. Uh, so any any employer hiring one or more employee on a part-time basis, part or full-time basis, is required to carry workers' comp. Period. That's uh, that's the law. Um, now, farmers do have a um, a bit of a waiver. Uh, they're only required to carry workers' comp if they have an aggregate payroll in excess of ten thousand dollars in a calendar year. So the people that have maybe a few. Uh, High school kids that come and help out, uh, a few people working part time during the summer to to help uh, you know pick a crop or, or something uh, at the farm, uh, and they and they don't reach uh, uh, an aggregate of um, ten thousand, then they are not required to uh, carry workers' comp. The uh, the only real remedy that they would have in the event of someone getting injured in that event would be the the farm policy. They would have to go back and uh, prove negligence on the part of the uh, the farmer um, to uh, to provide some type of um, uh, remedy for that. So, and then um, so if we go down the um, and the cost associated for workers' comp, uh, it's based on the farming done. Again, just like your auto policies, it depends on what you're doing, uh, and that uh, determines the uh, the premiums. So if you're doing vegetable farming, dairy, beef. Horses, sheep, uh, any number of those things. Um, minimum premiums in Vermont, uh, anyway, run anywhere from four hundred to nine hundred dollars a year. So, um, and I will address a couple of the um, the questions here that uh, arose earlier. Uh, let's see. I have volunteers helping me on my farm from high school age and up. What kind of coverage would protect me uh, if they're injured? Well, at that point, uh, the other area that um, is excluded, uh, or farms, uh, uh, or any pretty much any business has a waiver on, would be volunteers. So, if you have somebody volunteering their services uh, to help out on the farm, uh, they are by state law not required to um, have workers' comp. Uh, I would certainly uh, advise anyone that has volunteers, though. Make sure that their their insurance company knows that they they do have uh, volunteers um, helping out on the farm just uh, just so they know um, in the events uh, something happens uh, to those individuals. Okay, so okay, here's another one. Do I have do I have to have workers' comp for volunteers, interns, or apprentices? Again, volunteers are are um, are waived under the law. Interns, uh, apprentices. Again, if they're, the, I would uh, classify those individuals as volunteers. They're not getting paid. They are learning the trade, uh, but they are again, uh, they're not uh, technically employed uh, by your operation. So in that, in that instance, um, again, they wouldn't, uh, wouldn't need uh, the coverage for that. So, let's see. Okay. All right. Okay, and I have a couple of more uh, questions. Okay, on the workers' comp. Uh, let's see. Can you get can you get workers' comp for yourself? Uh, you can get workers' comp for yourself. Um, it's very expensive, um, and that's about all I can say about that. It's uh, it's very costly for the individual to to purchase uh, workers' comp for themselves, uh, even. With today's medical cost, uh, medical insurance costs, you're better off uh, getting a uh, a medical policy and perhaps some type of uh, disability insurance. Um, workers' comp will be very expensive for for the uh, the self-employed uh, to purchase. Um, it is based on the salary, uh, your gross uh, um, salary that you're going to take on. So. Um, you know, if if you're not if you don't make a lot, uh, it might be worth looking into. But um, my experience with it has been that it's uh, it's very costly for the individual to uh, purchase that. And the other issue is, um, 
you're better off with your own with medical insurance because the workers' comp is only going to uh, cover your your uh, injuries or, or uh, illnesses, uh, that type of thing, for on-the-job exposures. So if you're off on vacation somewhere and you get hurt, the workers' comp policy is not really going to help you. Okay, so then we have a question from Joan. Uh, do you need workers' comp for contractors who work on the property if they don't carry their own insurance? Uh, no, you don't need um, you don't need to carry coverage for them. Although I would advise that if you're carrying a workers' comp policy on your own, you make sure that these individuals. Well, first of all, I would make sure that the contractors have coverage. Because what happens is, if you don't carry in a workers' comp either, then it's kind of a wash. You really don't get charged for it. But if you have your own workers' comp policy, and you hire a subcontractor to come and do work on your farm or your, your business, what's going to happen at the end of the year is the company's going to come in and audit you and say, well, what's this uh, cost for? You pay this subcontractor, subcontractor you know, X amount of dollars. Uh, their, uh, where is their their coverage? Did they give you a certificate of insurance uh, pro, uh, providing, uh, proving that they have uh, their own workers' comp? Uh, in that event, uh, if they cannot produce that, if you can't produce that for the, co for the company, that company is going to charge you under your own policy for those individuals. So the safest bet is to, when you hire uh, subcontractors, is to make sure that they do carry their own coverage. OK, and Ruth asked, uh, would those volunteers need to provide written verification that they are volunteers? Um, oh, I don't know about that. I um, I think some type of agreement, uh, uh, something that you could have uh, written, might be a good idea. Uh, that you know. Uh, so and so acknowledges that they are volunteer for you and are not uh, being compensated in any way. Uh, that would probably be a, a safe bet. So, okay. Let's see. Next, we have Erica says, if you're farming in New York, the Department of Labor, Labor is very touchy about volunteers, interns, apprentices, and does and does require farmers to carry workers' comp on them, and in most cases. Some rare exceptions can be made for the people receiving academic credits as part of their work. Well, that's interesting. Um, yeah, it's a little different in Vermont. Um, and I can understand uh, you know, that in New York State, I guess. Uh, they are a little different. They, we don't actually do business over there. So um, uh, that is uh, certainly news to me. So I appreciate that. OK. Any other questions on the workers' comp area? And I think I've covered. Pretty much everyone's question uh, online and what I have uh, pre-submitted here as well. So, yes, workers' comp is a uh, uh, something uh, to do with everyday life, something we have to have um, for the most part, uh, and is certainly a, a large cost of uh, your cost of operations. So, if we go on our next area. OK, I'm not sure why that's in there. Disregard that one. That shouldn't be in there. OK, the next slide, uh, ensuring the farm operation. So here we go with the, we'll talk a little bit more. I discussed in general the, uh, the farm owner's policy. Um, so we're going to talk about ensuring the farm operation. So if we look at the definition, uh, this is a definition that we use. Uh, as an insurance company. So farming means the ownership, maintenance, or use of premises for the production of crops or raising or care of livestock, including all necessary operations. So that's a pretty broad statement. That, that covers a lot of territory. So what we mean, uh, your, all of your farm operations would be included in our, um, our, our farm coverage, uh, with the exception of a few uh, small hobby farms producing uh, something for sale. Um, each farmer, each farmer producing products or services is, a, is at risk, certainly. Um, this is kind of discussing the need for the, the coverage. And damage to others for, from those farm products uh, could be the most harmful risk faced by the farmer. So essentially, any product that you're producing, um, you know, you're at risk. You, uh, you certainly, uh, from a product's liability standpoint, uh, you know, I, uh, I buy some vegetables from the farm, or I buy some uh, raw milk, or I buy some, some eggs, uh, some meat from the farm, and I get ill. 
uh, that is definitely a uh, you know a products uh, liability issue and uh, something that we see more and more of uh, with with all of the farms uh, diversifying and uh, and selling um, you know farm stand uh, items. So so then we go into the next slide here, talking about the the farm buildings. Okay, so the uh, farm buildings uh, typically included on a farm uh, would be uh, the farm residence. Uh, typically, on your smaller farms, your hobby farms, uh, we have uh, just as a bit of an aside here. Our company offers uh, essentially two farm policies. Uh, we insure people under a what we call a mini farm policy. That would typically be your your hobby farm type uh, operations, and then we have a regular what we call a farm pack policy, which is your larger commercial uh, farm operation. So the mini farm policy is intended for those individuals where. The farm residence is usually the highest value on the policy, and that that individual, the individuals that own that operation, are um, they're earning the bulk of their living off the farm. So, you know, they they have an office job or they're off the farm job, and and they do this more or less as a hobby. Uh, it could, uh, constitutes a small percentage of their uh, of their income. So. With that, uh, again, the, the, for the smaller farms, the farm residents uh, usually the highest value on the policy. Um, the farm dwelling, including labor housing, rental dwellings, etc. So many of your farms, uh, if you have uh, help or seasonal help, uh, you will have uh, other houses uh, in addition to your own dwelling uh, that um, you know will house the seasonal uh, labor. Uh, and uh, you know the, the, those places uh, also need to be insured as well. Um, and many places have uh, a lot of farms will have uh, several uh, dwellings on them that uh, maybe at one time were occupied by a large the large family. Maybe they had a, a few family units uh, within those, but now they've converted them and are are renting those out just as uh, single family uh, rentals, that type of thing. So, so the, uh, the exposures go all over the place uh, under a farm uh, uh, risk. Uh, next we have the barns. Um, you know, typically we have a dairy barn or a chicken house, uh, a horse barn, sheep barn, goats, alpaca, beef. Uh, produce and processing and storage facilities. I mean all of those things uh, are typically found under a farm. The next item would be improvements and betterments. Uh, so that would be the situation where, for example, uh, an individual rents a property uh, and they need to upgrade the, the barn or, or certain buildings to include some processing facilities where they, they physically have to change the, uh, the building itself. Uh, you can typically either by lease agreement uh, insure the entire building or at least insure the improvements that you've made to that property. So the, in the event that, that that building burns down or gets blown down, that type of thing, uh, you would be able to recover the investment that you put into those buildings as well. Um, OK, uh, next we have uh, equipment sheds, uh, machinery sheds, uh, tractors, uh, tractor sheds, uh, farm shops, those types of things. Uh, typically, another thing we find a lot of roadside stands. Um, they're either uh, on a permanent basis or many uh, oftentimes they're on skids. People can pull them out near the road and then when the season's over, uh, you know, they tow them back behind the barn and, and leave them there till next season. Uh, retail, retail stores, we're seeing a lot more retail stores on the farms. Uh, either they're their own buildings or oftentimes they will be uh, built into uh, an existing barn or they're part of the house. Uh, so that that uh, is a whole other issue there. Um, greenhouses, uh, uh, lots of greenhouses these days. Uh, um, we're seeing uh, mostly plastic uh, cladded greenhouses, but we do see glass uh, on occasion. Um, and then uh, processing buildings, whether you're processing, you know, cheese or meat or vegetables or or that type of thing. So let's see. We have a couple of. Uh, Questions here. I will uh, shoot into those here. Let's see. From Caitlin, um, I assume that all of the buildings on the property are already covered by Norm. Not sure what that means. Um, let's see. 
Okay, I guess that must be a private conversation. Sorry about that. Okay. Next we have the um, farm personal property. So this is an area that, um, this is all movable equipment. Um, this is going to be your your tractors and uh, implements, uh, wagons, self-propelled units, uh, choppers, those types of things, uh, all-terrain vehicles uh, used on the farm to get around. Uh, most uh, farms have those these days. Uh, you can also insure your leased and borrowed equipment. Uh, <coughs> insured for the, um, we do insure that for the uh, actual cash value, so that's your replacement cost less depreciation. More farm personal property. Um, coolers, milking equipment insured as, as farm personal property, or you can insure it under the building. Typically, your coolers, uh, um, vacuum pumps, those types of things are considered uh, part of the, the building uh, itself. And um, let's see. Next would be your tools. So all of your uh, your shop tools, the hand tools, uh, you know, forks, brooms, brushes, those types of things. Um, typically, uh, we insure those items uh, under what we call a blanket coverage, so you don't have to itemize everything. Uh, it makes uh, life a lot easier. Uh, let's see. Okay. Automobiles and pickups uh, insured under the personal auto policy. Um, if you're using the vehicle primarily for farm use, that is errands, etc., Make sure the the vehicle is is classified as farm use, and I did touch upon that uh, earlier, um, just to kind of reaffirm that. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, large uh, farm trucks, uh, trailers insured under commercial auto. That's more of your your farm personal property, and then um, uh, last uh, is your hay, vegetables, uh, specifically listed. Um, milk, cheese, meat, all of those items that are uh, produced at the farm, uh, stored at the farm, uh, we, we would uh, consider that uh, um, part of the farm personal property. Uh, certainly it would be your inventory uh, prior to it being sold. So, okay. So if we go on, that's uh, just another area here. Okay. Okay, we have a question from our moderator. Let's see. Does this mean crops that are already harvested, or does this include veggies in the field? No, this would be harvested crops. Uh, vegetables in the field, uh, that would have to be uh, insured under, a, uh, for example, the uh, government's uh, crop insurance program those types of things. So apples and vegetables and corn and, and those types of things. Now, once the crop is harvested, we can insure those once they're stored away in a building. Um, but while they're in the field, we, um, we don't uh, insure those types of things. OK. So. Okay, so liability for the farm operation. Um, okay, so liability is it includes certainly the premises. That's your your whole farm operation, um, all the land, uh, all of those things, products and completed operations. So your your products are you're probably your your biggest uh, exposure uh, for those of you who are producing crops, uh, particularly uh, vegetables. Uh, um, you know, selling uh, milk, selling meat, selling eggs, selling, um, you know, meat, that type of thing. Uh, that's all a, a really big exposure. So let's talk about uh, the standard farm liability insurance contract reads as follows. And this is, this is essentially some of our wording here. Um, we, uh, we will pay up to our limit all sums in which the insured is liable by law because of bodily injury or property damage caused by an occurrence to which this coverage applies. We will defend a suit seeking damages if the suit results from bodily injury or property damage not excluded under this policy. And I'm just looking back. We do have a question from Ruth uh, on the going back to the property section. I'll deviate here a little bit. We'll get that covered. 
Well, let's see. Would chickens be covered if they were killed by a weasel before being ready for sale? Um, yes, but typically um, you would have to lose a lot of them. Usually there's a, for example, most farm policies have either a, a $500 or a $1,000 deductible under them. So you'd have to lose a fair number of chickens for, for that to happen. But yes, uh, they would be covered. Uh, as long as you could uh, get over your deductible. Um, I know how that is. I lost about 20 chickens earlier this spring, and I believe it was a weasel that got in there and, and took care of them. But that can be a little frustrating, unfortunately. Um, but for example, um, you know, your um, just t touching a little bit more on the animals. Uh, for example, uh, uh, cattle. Uh, you know, if they can be, you know, if they're hit by lightning, uh, they're chased by uh, coyotes. Uh, uh, they're injured or killed by those types of things, or sheep, or or anything like that. Horses. Uh, we insure all of that under under our farm policy. Um, the only thing we don't do. Uh, as a company is to insure for animal mortality. So that would be simply if the animal gets sick and dies. Um, that's something we don't do. Uh, there are specialty coverages out there, especially companies that, that do that type of thing. But you know, we're insuring the, the animals uh, if you know, you're transporting them. Uh, uh, they go through the ice uh, on a pond and drown. Um, they get stuck in the mud. and, and uh, can't get out of there and uh, you know basically die from as a result. Uh, so those types of things are all covered uh, under a farm policy. So it gives you a little broader answer, I guess. So let's see. Um, so next, under the uh, we talked about the uh, um, bodily injury and property damage. Now coverage, uh, something you should really consider. Um, uh, not most people uh, just hear of the um, the verdicts on uh, um, you know these large liability cases that type of thing. Uh, one of the biggest costs to everyone is the defense costs. Oftentimes, the defense costs uh, to defend an individual is more than the ultimate settlement itself. Uh, oftentimes, things are worked out. Uh, you know, out before a trial or out of court, and uh, an agreement is made, uh, and it's X number of dollars. And then the insured, uh, the, the the defendant, uh, gets a bill from the attorneys, <laughs> and it's as much or more uh, than the uh, the actual uh, uh, settlement itself. So something to keep in mind: the defense costs are are hugely important. And on any policy that you have, make sure that your defense costs are outside of the limit of the policy. So what I'm saying is if, for example, you have a million dollar uh, per occurrence liability limit under your policy, you want to make sure that the defense costs are outside of that limit. So that means the policy is going to pay not only the settlement, but it's going to pay the defense costs as well. If you have a policy that reads the defense costs are within the limit, then your, the, the policy is going to pay both, and uh, it's going to dry up that limit pretty quick with the defense costs. Most of your policy that you're going to find out there on the voluntary market uh, for farm or commercial insurance, the defense costs are going to be outside of the limit. So it's, it's not a worry. But it's just something to uh, keep in mind. And uh, um, you know, knowledge is, uh, is certainly uh, a good tool to have there in that, in that case. So. Uh, so then we drop down uh, premises and operation. This is your the premises uh, of your farm. Um, coverage would uh, you know you would have coverage for bodily injury, property damage on the farm premises. This would be uh, you know from slips and falls, cuts, bruises, etc. So you have uh, uh, many farms that have farm stands. You have people you know buying raw milk or buying eggs in the barn. They go into the barn and and uh, they slip. Uh, Typically, uh, uh, barn environments are, are somewhat damp, um, and, and farm environments typically are not, you know, perfect. So there are a lot of uneven ground and, um, you know, slippery areas that people can uh, can fall in. People have open houses; they have functions there. Uh, all of those things are certainly uh, uh, leaving you exposed to some type of um, uh, damage uh, suit. Um, okay. Oh, we have another question here. I'll just jump back to that, and I'll tend to do that here. Uh, okay, from Betsy, 
what about fencing, electric or not, damaged by electrical storms or wildlife such as moose? Um, typically, that's not covered under the policy. Um, that, uh, you know, unless you had some type of elaborate uh, uh, fencer that uh, was really high valued, I mean, the lightning, uh, a lightning uh, uh, shock would s certainly, a uh, lightning bolt would be co covered under the policy, but typically the equipment that runs the electric fence uh, is going to be way under your dedu deductible anyway. So, and yes, uh, moose can damage fence, and we, we do have a lot of people that, that have that loss. It's just one of those things that uh, inher is inherent to the, uh, the farming business. Uh, I've had that happen several times at my farm, uh, whether it be moose or uh, koi dogs or something else running through there, and next thing you know, your animals are all out uh, uh, and the neighbors are calling. So uh, <laughs> the, the bigger issue uh, in that situation would not necessarily be the, uh, the damage to the fence. It's going to be the damage that the animals do to somebody else, uh, either on the road or trampling over through uh, uh, somebody's yard. and. Uh, requiring a new uh, lawn to be put in, those types of things. So, Okay, we have another question from Jessica. Let's see. What if someone is injured at the farmer's market while shopping at your booth, your umbrella falls on them, or they trip over a box? What part of the policy covers this off-premises injury? That's a good question. Uh, you would have coverage for that. That is something that you should tell your, that you really need to tell uh, your insurance agent or company that's insuring you that you're going to be t uh, attending these farmers markets. Uh, they might have a slight charge, additional charge under your farm policy, uh, but the policy will contemplate uh, coverage for that. Um, so yes, in, in this example where uh, the person is uh, standing at your booth and a little gust of wind comes up and knocks the umbrella over, <clears throat> conks them in the head, and, and they are injured and need stitches or something like that, um, you know that would be <clears throat> that would be a, a bodily injury uh, uh, loss and something your company would uh, readily pay. Um, you know, the, uh, the other issue is, <clears throat> depending on where they are at the farmer's market, uh, you know, who is, who is responsible for it? Is it, uh, is it a, um, you know, a hole in the ground that the owners of the uh, premises or the farmer's market organization uh, association should have uh, repaired? Uh, is it a, a common area? Those types of things. Um, you know, common area, typically the, the farmer's market uh, will have insurance for the market itself, uh, and then they require certainly the individual vendors to uh, uh, <coughs> insure their um, particular um, booth and the products that they're selling as well. So, um, so yes, they would have you would have coverage under the uh, <laughs> under the policy um, <coughs> for farmers markets, and you know for your farm stands on the farm as well. So uh, it goes without saying that that would be covered as well. So. So we talked about the slips and falls, um, injuries uh, going back to the liability, um, injuries caused from the operation of the equipment or implements. Uh, so that's an important thing if you're uh, uh, driving your equipment down the road uh, and your, uh, your flashers uh, aren't working or you don't have your uh, slow moving vehicle signs uh, on the tractor, that type of thing, and it's kind of dusky, that's usually when they, the accidents happen. You know, somebody runs into the, the, the back of your equipment, uh, you cause an accident, you know, you're on the hook. Those types of things are, are, are contemplated and covered under the, under the farm policy. Um, so again, it can be either be on the farm, you have, uh, that's why certainly you shouldn't have riders on the, uh, on the equipment. That can cause uh, uh, damage, uh, bodily injury damage, certainly on the roadway. Uh, <clears throat> like we just addressed with the fencing situation, livestock uh, escaping from uh, fences, uh, that's, that's one of the bigger areas that uh, we do pay a lot of claims on. Uh, typically it'll be, um, you know, a cow or a horse or sheep in the road that uh, either do damage to the vehicle or, you know, the, um, the person driving the car, uh, um, you know, gets in an accident to avoid the animal, to avoid hitting the animal, those types of things. Again, that's all, that's all on you. So, uh, let's see, 
causing damages to other autos. Neighbors' lawns, again, we talked about that. Uh, we pay a lot of claims for animals getting out, uh, damaging, uh, particularly running through neighborhoods. That's always a fun claim to pay. Um, you know, lots of uh, people uh, annoyed at your uh, critters out there running around uh, damaging their lawns that they just made umpteen thousand dollars to uh, have landscape. So, okay. And then uh, other issues, uh, you know, um, injuries from uh, horse riding lessons or training. Uh, we have a lot, of, we insure a lot of horse farms that uh, uh, either uh, are bored or they are providing lessons. Um, they have arenas that uh, people come and, and ride their horses in or they have trails that uh, people come and ride their horses around on those. Uh, those, those are all certainly uh, liability exposures that, uh, that need to be addressed. Um, and certainly don't automatically assume that uh, all of these exposures, once you have the farm policy uh, will be covered. Uh, oftentimes, companies are, are uh, picky about uh, you know uh, who they're, uh, what type of risk they're insuring. Uh, they may say they're uh, they're going to insure farms, but oh by the way, we don't like uh, don't like it that you have horses on this farm or uh, those types of things. So certainly, it's something to. Um, uh, uh, Check out when you're when you're purchasing your insurance. Certainly, uh, uh, a good company is going to uh, go through a number of uh, underwriting, uh, pre-fault qualification uh, type questions uh, to make sure that uh, you and they are, are are a good fit. So, so then we talk about the uh, if we look at the bottom of the slide, it's the uh, products or completed operations. So. We discussed that a little bit earlier. If the bodily injury occurs as a result of consuming or using your farm products, uh, there would be liability coverage for this. Um, you know, this is something that uh, we're seeing an uh, ever-increasing uh, exposure uh, on our part uh, for people that are uh, growing vegetables. They're they're uh, milking a few cows and selling some raw milk. They're they're raising chickens, selling eggs. They're selling. Uh, uh, selling poultry, uh, they're selling, uh, you know, raising pigs, selling pork, um, you know, all types of things. Selling a lot of beef, and oftentimes it's done, uh, you know, processed right on the premises, and uh, you know, sold directly to the consumer. That can be, uh, that can be tricky. Um, you know, if you have an individual that um, doesn't quite know what they're doing, uh, it can be a, a big problem for uh, not only the consumer that's uh, ultimately uh, getting sick on that uh, product, but the uh, the person that's selling that product uh, certainly has a lot to lose there as well. So we're uh, Jessica. Oh, okay, here we go. Uh, okay. Here's another question uh, from Max. If you're growing on someone else's property, who would be responsible for premises-related injury? Well. Uh, that would be both of you. Uh, you as the the uh, the renter and uh, the uh, the owner, the landlord uh, would certainly be uh, liable as well. Uh, that's a, that's a good question. That prompts another question uh, from um, uh, right along that same line, uh, and I will read that and, and cover both at the same time here. Uh, I'm farming on leased land. No contract, just a handshake. Uh, the property owner wants to know if she could be sued if I or one of my farm workers is injured on her property or a customer is injured by one of my farm products. Does the property owner need additional insurance uh, coverage or can I get coverage that will cover all related events even though I don't own the land? Well, technically, uh, the handshake, and oftentimes it is a handshake. Uh, it's the neighbor down the road saying, oh, you know, I've got another 10 acres down here. If you want to use that, uh, go ahead. Um, that is an agreement. That constitutes a verbal agreement, and it's as, it's, uh, as good as if you are uh, legally renting that land. So you are the um, you are the operator of that farm. Uh, and as such, uh, certainly uh, uh, liable for any uh, injuries that are uh, that happen there that they can prove you know they can prove you negligent that. I mean, if somebody's just wandering on your property and has no permission to be there, that's a whole other story. But if you're invi inviting uh, customers onto the property to pick your own, uh, to come to the farm stand, to to purchase your product, uh, and they're injured in some fashion due to 
a piece of your equipment there or a building that, that fails, uh, that type of thing, uh, yes, indeed, you, you would be uh, uh, liable for that. Uh, you would be covered under your farm policy. Uh, in, in response to the landlord themselves, they would have to prove the landlord negligent uh, for something that happened on, on your farming operation. So clearly, uh, in the event that the example that Jessica used with the umbrella falling over and um, you know, injuring somebody uh, either at the farm stand or the farmer's market. Um, the landlord had nothing to do with that. The landlord didn't set the, the, t the umbrella up, didn't set the building up, uh, none of that. Um, so in that case, typically it's going to fall to the, the, uh, uh, you, the farmer, uh, and not necessarily the landowner. Uh, but it's always my recommendation that people, and this question comes up all the time, I'm using this person's land or I'm renting this farmer's land, uh, but the farmer doesn't want, to, the owner doesn't want to uh, incur any cost. So um, unfortunately, by uh, mere virtue of the fact that they own the land, they are going to incur a cost. Uh, it's in their own best interest to incur a cost. Um, you can uh, insure the property as the farm uh, operator. Uh, you can include them as a, what we call an additional insured under your policy. So the, in, in the event that something happens, um, you know, they would be covered under your policy just the same as you would. Uh, we always recommend that the owner of the land uh, get a, uh, what we call an incidental farming uh, endorsement under their, uh, under the, their homeowners, uh, typically their homeowners policy. Uh, if they already have a farm policy, then that policy is going to contemplate the fact that they're leasing out the land and, and uh, the company will already know that information. Um, <clears throat> but. Um, the, the, the landowner will want to uh, have that uh, endorsement on their policy just in the event that uh, a suit is brought against both parties, and, and oftentimes that's going to happen. The, you have the person that's renting the farm operation uh, is going to uh, uh, be sued, and the landlord uh, will be sued as well. Uh, just for, you know, the deep pockets theory, uh, attorneys uh, do that uh, fairly often. So. So let's talk, let's see, uh, so that was Max, uh, let's see, Betsy, uh, what about land lease to another farmer for copper hay? Okay, again, uh, that's a good question. Um, typically, you will want the, to make sure that the, um, the person that's farming, cropping the, the farm, certainly has uh, some type of farm liability in the event that something happens. Um, uh, you'll definitely want to uh, make sure that they have coverage. And again, the, as the owner of the uh, of the land itself, uh, you'll want to make sure that um, you have what we call a if it's if it's a non-farm policy, a homeowner's type policy. You'll want to make sure that you have a uh, uh, incidental farm uh, endorsement, and they cost little or nothing. There's very uh, very low premium on those uh, uh, types of uh, coverages. So, but well worth having and. Uh, um, that's that's definitely uh, uh, words words of advice for you. Uh, okay. Okay. So let's go on. We talked about the. Okay. Here's another question. Um, okay, from Betsy. We have ponds which are fished by people, some with permission and some who, regardless of no trespassing signs. Okay, understood. Uh, all of us who own farmland uh, often uh, uh, are subject to those exposures. Uh, you know, uh, many of us uh, own enough acreage that we cannot see all of the acreage that we own. So you're going to have individuals, particularly if they're people living around or people that know that, hey, there's a great fishing hole, there's a great swimming spot. Um, you can put up the signs. And, and that's really your due diligence. I mean, that's, your, um, that's, that's a great idea, and that's certainly a, a defense that you can use. Um, you know, it is hard typically to, I'm not an attorney, uh, certainly, and, uh, uh, but see a lot of claims that, that come through here. Uh, it, believe it or not, it is hard to um, prove that you as the landowner are negligent in the event, for, your, for example, your pond, um, somebody fishing there and they, they slip on a rock and fall. Well, they weren't invited. Um, they knew the uh, risk going in. Um, so it's nothing that you changed, I mean, you didn't put up a, uh, 
you know, uh, a barbed wire wire across the uh, entrance and, uh, you know, hit it so that they'd get injured coming in. Those types of things, uh, if you've done nothing to um, affect the property other than put your signs up, I think you're in pretty good shape. And, and certainly your policy uh, would, uh, would pay, particularly the defense costs. And that's really, that's really what it comes down to. Ultimately, those cases uh, don't settle out. Um, the, the defense costs are the things that are going to uh, cost you a fortune. Um, we've had issues where people uh, snowmobile on land, um, and the landowner, landowner um, gets fed up with it and strings a cable across the access uh, to that land. Uh, those same individuals that were snowmobiling there last year come zooming through and they don't even see the cable and <laughs> have, a, have a tremendous injury uh, as a result of going and hitting that cable. Uh, we have had those and um, we have defended those and ultimately paid, uh, paid the price too. Um, so, but that's in a case where you as a landowner have actually modified the, uh, the property uh, and not given a clear warning to, to the public. Um, but you owe a far less duty to those individuals that you have not invited uh, onto that property. So Betsy adds, uh, what about hunting? Uh, same thing. Um, you, can, uh, you can post your land. And again, that is a defense uh, that you can use. Um, uh, you know, even giving people permission to farm on the land, uh, to uh, hunt on the land, uh, certainly doesn't um, you know, encumber you to, to them at all uh, in the event that they're injured. Again, it's a hard, um, a hard thing for them to prove you're negligent because they were simply walking your fields. But we have paid those claims as well. OK. Jessica, OK. Should try to wrap up in the next 15 minutes. OK. So you want me to talk a lot faster? OK, I will do that. OK. So here we go. All right, and we, we did address this a little bit, so, but uh, one, of the, uh, one of the big areas that uh, we do find with the small uh, hobby farm type uh, operations um, are the farmers markets. Um, you know, this is a case where your liability coverage is, is going to become very important. Um, you know, whether you're selling at the farmer's markets, you've got to stand at the farm, farm retail store. Uh, many operations are doing uh, mail order. Uh, they're on the internet. Uh, they're shipping uh, items. They have a, a bed and breakfast uh, at their farm. Um, and then they have a little shop in there where they sell their products, or they sell syrup, or they sell, sell all types of knickknacks, that type of thing. Uh, when you're going to <coughs> home shows and fairs, um, you know, you need the liability coverage uh, for your farm products and for those items that you're selling, uh, very important. Those types of uh, <coughs> those types of exposures are certainly covered under your your farm policy, uh, and uh, certainly you can address that with your agent or, or company. Um, again, selling at farmers markets. Um, Basically, uh, as the uh, slide says, you're on your own in terms of liability. So what that's saying is, if you go to a farmer's market and assume that the farmer's market is going to insure your products while you're there that you're selling, um, you're mistaken. The, many of the farmer's markets today are requiring that the vendor, you the farmer, um, provide them with evidence of insurance, uh, certificate of insurance, uh, provide it, proving that you have uh, liability coverage. Not only that, but since you have products liability coverage for those items that you're selling. Um, and this is the, the farm, the market itself protecting itself because ultimately in the event that something, uh, you know, somebody got sick on, a, on an item that the vendor was selling, um, you know, the farmer's market uh, could ultimately be drawn into that claim uh, and, and ultimately have to uh, potentially pay. And I will tell you that many of these farmers markets do not carry uh, products liability coverage so simply because they can't afford it. It's, it's very costly. Um, so um, again, we talked about that. Typically, you're going to find the market is only co going to provide coverage uh, for those vendors uh, that are there um, for people that are coming and going, trip and fall hazards, that type of thing. Uh, again, you, you really may need to make sure that, uh, that you have this coverage. Um, 
let's see. Again, uh, just dropping down mail order uh, sales. Make sure there's coverage for products uh, while they're in transit. If, uh, if it's a costly item, um, <clears throat> you know we can ensure. Uh, the farm policy to uh, ensure this type of exposure. Most uh, most farm insurers can do the same thing as well. So just a quick uh, thing here. Uh, uh, a lot of people assume that because they have a homeowner's policy, uh, they're going to automatically be covered for raising a few animals, uh, that type of thing. And typically, if you have one or two uh, animals and they get out uh, on the road or that type of thing, yes, the homeowner's policy will pay uh, some liability coverage for that. But in the event that um, you're, um, um, you're you're running a farm operation under a homeowner's policy, um, farming is a business by definition, uh, and there is no coverage under the homeowner's policy. So, as the slide says, the homeowner's policy is meant to cover homes, not farms. Um, you can have an incidental farming endorsement added. This would be for the person that just simply owns the property and somebody else is coming on and uh, renting the farm um, and, and just using your land, that type of thing. So <clears throat> let's see. The, the biggest area, I will uh, just address this under the homeowner's policy, uh, even if you have an incidental uh, farming endorsement uh, and you're selling uh, eggs or you're selling uh, chickens or you're selling some raw milk from a couple, uh, maybe a cow that you own uh, under a homeowner's policy, keep in mind, unless uh, the company specifically tells you it's on there, uh, you probably do not have any products liability coverage. So if somebody gets sick uh, uh, or dies uh, as a result of uh, consuming your product under a homeowner's policy, the homeowner's policy will not cover that. So that's something that's uh, very important to uh, to consider. Um, the next the next slide, uh, just for quick reference here, <clears throat> this is just to give an example of uh, some of the um, uh, premiums associated with uh, what it might cost you to uh, to have a farm. So example one, I've got a dwelling at $150,000 coverage, uh, 500 deductible. For example, you might have a barn worth 100,000. Let's say you have three greenhouses. You have some farm personal property, uh, $50,000. Farm liability, $300,000 limit. For example, um, your premium would probably be around $1,400, $1,500. Um, if you if you change your deductibles, uh, increase, for example, your deductibles on the uh, house and the barn to a thousand, that could conceivably drop the premium to around eight hundred something. So, and then if we go over to example two, we bump it up a little bit. Again, two fifty on the house, uh, three hundred thousand on the barn, more greenhouses at a hundred thousand. Um, uh, farm personal property in the amount of a hundred thousand, let's say, farm liability at a million, uh, in, in including, uh, for example, if you had a, a CSA, a pick your own farm stand, farmers markets, all of those exposures, those types of things, you're probably paying around three thousand, thirty-five hundred dollars. You increase your deductible, a thousand dollars. It does have a pretty significant impact on the um, the cost of the uh, uh, the coverage. So, uh, let's see. All right, so that, and if we go on to the the next slide here, that's my um, that kind of wraps it up. That's my contact information. Um, I do have one. If we have a couple seconds here, I do have a um, couple of questions with regard to uh, the need for insurance. Uh, I do have one question that says, uh, "I have no assets to lose if someone sues me." Why do I need insurance coverage? Well, that's a question that does come up from time to time, and uh, it is a good question. Um, the uh, the question I would have back to this individual would be, who owns the property? Who's the landlord? Uh, they have a lot to lose, and would certainly uh, uh, want you to have coverage uh, to make sure that they're going to have coverage. Uh, and in the uh, the event, uh, it's it's an interesting uh, position uh, to 
to place yourself in, if, in this case, with no assets. Uh, is that to say that this individual will never have any earnings or assets? Because I can tell you, if there is some type of suit brought against an individual, that thing will haunt them the rest of their lives. So the, uh, the suit can say, uh, we will attach any future wages or assets that this person uh, may accumulate. Um, and there's the big, that is the big rub. That's the, um, that's, that's why you need insurance. Uh, and then uh, I do have another question. Um, I sell raw milk and poultry. I process on my farm. Will any insurance cover company offer me liability protection? Uh, and the answer to that is uh, yes. Um, we we uh, uh, typically will do that type of uh, cover uh, somebody that does those types of things. Uh, that is uh, certainly subject to underwriting our underwriting criteria. Uh, typically, some type of farm inspection would be required to to make sure the process is okay. And um, and that, uh, but we yes, there is a market. Uh, we would certainly do that. So okay, that's all I have. So um, okay, let's see. Okay, here we have another question. Okay, um, yes, uh, Max. Here's here's a question for Max. Uh, the approximate premiums from the latest slide, uh, last slide shown a year ago. Yes, those are annual premiums on those. Correct. Yep. And then from Kaylin, uh, oh, that's, uh, let's see. Okay. Does it make sense to get disability insurance for myself? Uh, I would uh, certainly uh, advise, uh, uh, yes, it, it does make sense. Um, it, you know, it's one of those things you never know. Um, you know, you could, uh, you know, lifting a crate of something, you could put your back out and, and be, uh, you know, uh, out for six months. Uh, then who does the work? So, uh, you know, who pays the bills? That, that type of thing. So, so it's definitely a very important uh, coverage to have. So. so, any other questions? or? Kevin, uh, this has been yes. really great. Um, I certainly learned oh, a lot. I, I, I hope it was worthwhile. Uh, during this presentation and a lot of questions that come up with the farmers that I work with um, uh, sure. were definitely answered. So thank you okay, very great. much. Um, any last questions, uh, type them quickly in the chat box. Um, and otherwise, uh, looks like everyone's saying thank you. So. Um, we will sign okay. off, and uh, if you haven't already, uh, do put your email address in the chat box. I'll capture those and send you some follow-up information um, at a later date. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. Great. Okay, you're welcome, and thanks for joining us, all of you, and uh, have a great night. Good night. Okay, good night now.